All right, welcome once again to this month's Wildlife for Lunch webinar. It'll be on Nuisance Wildlife Control, presented by Michael Bodenchuk, State Director for the Texas Wildlife Services Program. This month's webinar is made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition Incorporated, and it's hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. With that, Mike, I'll pass the controls over to you, and you can get started. Thank you, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I am Mike Bodenchuk. I'm the State Director for Texas Wildlife Services. The Wildlife Services Program is a truly cooperative effort in Texas between Texas A&M, AgriLife Extension, USDA, APHIS Wildlife Services, and the Texas Wildlife Damage Management Association. It's important to note our program does not manage wildlife. Our program is charged both under state and federal law with resolving conflicts that are caused by wildlife. And so when we talk about nuisance wildlife, that's well within the range of the things that we ordinarily work on. When we talk about nuisance wildlife, I think we all know what we're, what we're thinking about, but uh, quite honestly for a webinar, I had to put some sideboards on it myself. I looked up the word nuisance and it, it includes harm or injury, one that is annoying, unpleasant, or obnoxious. And certainly for native wildlife, um, I'd like to make sure that we understand that, that not all species or a species, all members of a species would be considered nuisance. We, we're going to talk later on, you'll see slides where I have raccoons and skunks in there, but not all raccoons are a nuisance wildlife and, and not all skunks are nuisance wildlife. We're talking about individual animals within those species. And the term nuisance is clearly a human construct. It, it focuses on human objectives. It's it's not uh, it's not um, an ecosystem function, for example, when we're talking about native wildlife. However, if you're talking about invasive wildlife, things like nutria and starling and even feral hogs, maybe the whole species can be a nuisance. If you look at ecosystem functions, certainly uh, starlings and nutria affect those ecosystem functions. So we're going to bounce a little back and forth between native and invasive wildlife as we talk today. But I want you to understand we're talking about individuals within these species, not the species as a whole. We also have a big difference between rural, rural nuisance species and urban species. Rural properties may have more wildlife, and that's, that's a little marginal too, but, but they usually have fewer nuisance complaints. In my experience, um, part of the reason for that is that uh, rural residents have got a lot more tools at their option, and they're often able to shoot an animal and, and end, the, end the nuisance right then and there. Urban environments, however, sometimes have a lot of wildlife and have less tolerance for the wildlife damage. They've also got more resources available to damage. One raccoon walking down one city block can hit 10 or 12 houses all in the same night and create a lot more damage. So the tolerance for damage is lower, the resources are more con uh, concentrated, and the people there may be more uh, removed from the land, although probably the people attending this webinar are not. Um, the, uh, again, we, we need to make sure that we understand this, this idea of nuisance is in the eye of the beholder. When we talk about solutions, that makes a difference as well. Preventing wildlife conflicts is ultimately cheaper than solving them one at a time. Uh, prevention is necessary uh, when you're talking about uh, large-scale damage. When you're talking about a single animal, it, it may not be. Uh, when you're talking about uh, native species, we should consider prevention in the first case. What can I do to make this problem go away, not make the animal go away? For invasive species, you need to consider the cost. And the costs include ecosystem costs. If you uh, are, are able to solve a nutria problem with a non-lethal solution, but it keeps the nutria out there on the landscape and that nutria is doing damage to other na natural systems or natural resources, there's still a cost going on by, by solving it in that fashion. 
You also need to consider the ultimate desired condition. If we wanted to rid the the, uh, the continent of European starlings and we're going to do it one nuisance starling at a time, that's probably not a practical desired condition. And so we need to consider whether or not what we're proposing will lead to that ultimate uh, desired condition. In prevention, we've got quite a few different tools at our disposal. The first one is education. And, and um, most important, we need to make sure that everybody has the same perception of what the problem is, as well as people understanding the species and why it acts the way it does. We get a lot of calls in our urban programs from people who said, I saw a coyote. I saw a raccoon. And the fact that they saw it just by itself may not mean that there's a problem. That does not by itself mean that that, that, that species or that individual was a nuisance species. In fact, uh, there's a lot of wildlife that, that actually does very well next to people. Uh, Coyotes have been able to adapt. Raccoons and, and opossums are doing better with human settlement than they probably were in wilderness settings. And so we need to make sure that people understand that wildlife is out there because the environment's suitable for them, that it's part of the natural system, and just because they saw one, that doesn't mean that, that something has to be ta uh, a course of action has to be put in place. Uh, understanding the species is also important. I can tell you right now that in uh, March, April, and May, we're going to have a lot of nuisance coyote complaints because coyotes will be attacking dogs. In March, April, and May, that's right around the time that coyotes start having their own pups, and they, as a species, are going to try and exclude other canines from their territory. It happens every year. If you know that it's going to happen, if you know that coyotes are denning in the green space behind your house, understanding the species may give you a tool to deal with a problem in the first place. So you know, avoid the problem by not putting your dog out in the backyard and not looking, for, watching him. Another very popular uh, prevention method is exclusion. And we're going to talk about exclusion as we go through the different species that, that we're going to talk about and the different uh, wildlife damage situations that occur. But exclusion is probably the broadest range of things. And exclusion can be something as simple as wires. It can be a chimney cap on a chimney to keep raccoons out. It could be um, fencing or, or electric wires if you're talking about hogs around feeders. So there's a lot of opportunities for exclusion. Bird exclusion includes wires that are glued to a, a sill or netting that can be tacked up underneath a, a shop to keep them from uh, putting droppings on a tractor. Uh, cultural methods are probably a little harder to incorporate. The timing of crops, if you want to grow sunflowers in North Dakota, you don't have a whole lot of options. But if you want to grow sunflowers in Texas, it's best to put them in in the spring and get them out by the middle of summer so that the birds that migrate to Texas don't hit your crops as hard. So cultural methods may be an option, and, and you need to think about those kind of things. Free-range chickens are fine, but if skunks are eating your free-range chickens, maybe you need to put the chickens up at night in, in a skunk-proof uh, chicken coop, and, and that would be an example of a cultural method. Modifying habitat is, is uh, usually more permanent. Uh, it's a little more costly to do. Removing cover, removing food sources uh, are the cheaper parts of that. And in some species, it's not very applicable. I don't know what the habitat would have to look like to be not friendly for a raccoon. They can live in a dumpster and in a cinder block. So, so modifying habitat may not be applicable to everything that we're going to talk about. And hazing or harassment is another preventive tool, chasing the animal away before it becomes a nuisance. If you see that coyote and you make him afraid of people, maybe he won't become habituated to people and become a nuisance coyote, coyote later on. Hazing harassment is also a corrective tool, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. 
The same methods pretty much apply to corrective methods. So when we talk about preventing, it's, it's keeping a species from becoming a nuisance. Once you've got a nuisance complaint in there, there's still a need for education. You need to educate people about the wildlife. We're going to talk a little bit about snakes, and, and, and certainly if there's a place where you need education, it's, a, it's when you're dealing with snakes. Is that a poisonous snake? Is that a non-poisonous snake? What do I do? What's, what's sustainable and what isn't sustainable? So there's an education component in corrective control. Exclusion still works. It's a little more um, uh, timely if you do it beforehand, but uh, exclusion can still happen after uh, an animal has become habituated to your house. Hazing or harassment may work with some species. Things like bird roosts um, may be hazed after the after they've established and so uh, that is a corrective tool for some wildlife damage of course uh, when you get aggressive animals that may not be the best course to take trapping and relocating is a little bit controversial with wildlife biologists not because um, the animal may be that valuable or non-valuable we're not making value judgments about that but relocating efforts don't always work, and sometimes you're moving the problem. Trapping and relocating beavers, for example, is a great way to establish beavers in a new place, but it may not be just a few years before you have beaver problems in that new place, so that has to be done pretty carefully, and most relocation efforts require agency approval. Lethal removal is going to be the most controversial, and yet it's the one that most people uh, Think about it in the first place. There's a raccoon in my trash can. I'm going to shoot it. And in fact, it's it's probably uh, you know that raccoon's not going to come back. But if your trash can's still out there, you're still going to have another raccoon problem. So lethal removal may be considered as a last resort for nuisance wildlife. There are times that we use it, and 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 we are pretty good about making that decision, um, considering all the factors that are involved. But it should be the last resort when we're talking about native wildlife certainly. Legal considerations are really important when you're, when you're talking about this. Almost all of the species that we're talking about would be considered protected wildlife. So there are some bird species that are not protected, but almost everything has some protection. Of course, you've got legal considerations if you're talking about discharging a firearm inside of city limits. And there's legal considerations associated with the wildlife species. Many of the species that we're going to talk about, many of the animals that we're going to talk about today are uh, protected fur bearers under Texas statutes. And parks and wildlife regulations allow, and you'll see it up on the screen, landowners or their agents may take nuisance fur bearing animals in any number by any means at any time on that person's land without the need for a hunting or trapping license. That doesn't mean you can shoot a raccoon on your neighbor's land unless the neighbor allows you to be his agent. But you may not possess the animals or their pelts unless you have a hunting or a trapping license. So there's an example of, of legal considerations. There's also considerations around relocation. Fur bears may be captured and relocated only with parks and wildlife approval and the approval of the landowner where the animals will be released. However, it's a Class C misdemeanor to transport or sell live foxes, coyotes, or raccoons from, to, or within the state. And that's the result of the rabies epidemics that we have seen within those species. Uh, raccoons carry the skunk strain in Texas, um, gray fox strain in Texas, and the coyote strain in Texas have been eradicated at a, at a multi-million dollar cost through oral rabies vaccination. And we still put out oral rabies vaccines to keep it from coming back along the Mexican border. So there is, it is illegal to transport a raccoon within the state. If you're thinking about relocation, you need to consider that legal consideration. Let's talk about raccoons for a minute. Uh, raccoons can damage feed and feeders, buildings. They'll tear shingles off of houses to gain access to attic space. They'll den in chimneys. Uh, just like a chimney is, is to a raccoon the same as a hollow tree, and that's where they have their, their kits. 
They damage pets by biting them, fighting over pet food, damage the pet food itself if it's left outside. And there's a parasite that raccoons have that's pretty benign to raccoons. It's the raccoon roundworm. But the raccoon roundworm, when you get concentrations like you see in this photograph, can be a problem for humans. Raccoon roundworm eggs are shed in, in the droppings of raccoons, and those eggs are very environmentally resistant. Um, there have been eggs that were stored in formaldehyde that hatched two years later. And so raccoon roundworm uh, larvae can infect people. For adults, it might not be that big a deal. If you get a raccoon roundworm in you, you're probably going to wall that off within your blood system within, and, and, and not have any problems. But raccoon roundworms have been a real problem in children where you have high concentration of raccoon droppings and small children that don't have that ability to wall it off. There have been some real tragedies in the country associated with raccoon roundworm. The actual damage that they do is probably the tip of the iceberg. Raccoons are not territorial, and so there's just as many raccoons as the environment will, will support with food. And if you put more food out there, you'll just have more raccoons show up for it. So some of the ways to consider um, uh, preventing raccoon damage is to reduce their access to feed. Everybody with a deer feeder knows how hard that is to do, and there's a whole lot of, of uh, commercial products out there available to keep raccoons from getting to your corn and your deer feeders. But there's a whole lot of other food sources out there, whether it's scraps around the camp house or a, a trash dump on the ranch, all the way down to your trash can at your house. Uh, um, there's a lot of feed that raccoons will be able to find. Damage to your house can largely be averted by trimming the overhead branches that hang over your house. And, and that for a lot of people is an emotional hurdle. They don't want to do that. But a raccoon can crawl out on a limb and then drop down onto the house, tear the shingles off the house, and gain access to the chimney. And so trimming overhead branches to where they can't do that is, is probably the best idea. Of course, it, that might not help if your house is built into a hillside or if there's uh, bricks that are laid so that they can climb on the outside and, and still gain access to the roof. So you've got to consider it all in, in total. But one of the problems that we see a lot where there are chimneys, in North Texas especially, is raccoons denning in those chimneys. And of course, we talk about raccoon roundworm, there's no place that collects more, more droppings than a chimney when you've got a litter of raccoons that stay in there for two to three months. There are commercially available chimney caps that you can buy and have put on top. You can plug holes in, in the attic and make sure that the raccoons don't get in there. Certainly you don't want to plug holes while the mother is outside and the kids are on the inside or she's going to tear even more up trying to get back to them. A very common solution in rural situations is to trap and euthanize raccoons. And a live cage trap put outside with some kind of food in, in it uh, is is very attractive to raccoons. It's also attractive to house cats, by the way. And so when I tell people to trap raccoons, I tell them to trap with a sweet bait rather than a fish bait. Fish bait, you'll end up catching the neighbor's cat. But uh, something as simple as a Twinkie with a little liquid vanilla on it will attack, uh, attract them by the smell. And raccoons can taste sugar, but house cats can't taste sweet. And so raccoons will go in there for the bait where you probably won't catch a house cat that way. If you're going to set a, a, a trap for a raccoon, you need to know that he's going to tear up the lawn underneath it. So you either need to put it in a dirt spot and might work dirt down into the wires underneath the, uh, the bottom of the cage trap, or you need to put the trap on a board that's a little bit larger than the trap so when he reaches his fingers out through there, he won't tear up the lawn quite so bad. Striped skunks, when I uh, wrote the part about uh, the whole species not being a nuisance, I, I really had to think about striped skunks. I haven't found a striped skunk that liked me yet. Uh, they, they, the odor problem associated with striped skunks is what most people are worried about, but striped skunks also have a rabies uh, component. They, um, they can bite your pets and, and cause considerable concern there. 
oddly enough, when they get rabid, they, they usually lose the neurological ability to spray. And I've had rabid skunks that we could take a broom and sweep into a cage trap and, and never get sprayed by them just because of that rabies. When you're looking at skunks, mostly they don't travel very far, you know, less than a mile home range, and they live in burrows or underground holes. And so removing burrowing opportunities is probably your first and foremost consideration in dealing with skunks. Um, rock walls that are stacked rocks are real pretty, but sometimes the, they can burrow in between the rocks and get in there and, and establish a den that will be there all summer. So you need to watch those rock walls and, and uh, make sure that you plug any holes or any dirt that gets dug out between there. Ornamental plants along your house and your lawn, uh, skunks don't have good vision and they tend to hug either bushes or buildings or both. And the best place for a skunk to walk is between your, your, your shrubs and the, the house. Um, and that could create some problems and, and a real attraction for skunks. If you if you trim your your hedges to to square up the tops and the sides, you might also want to consider squaring up the bottoms and allowing some air underneath there and allowing some light to get underneath there, and that will make it a lot less attractive to striped skunks and and they won't be traveling at least up against the building right there. Removing food sources, skunks don't generally climb. I know uh, everybody's got a story about a skunk here or there that, that climbed up on a chair, but skunks can't pull themselves up. And so, you know, if, if people are worried about skunks eating dog food, all they got to do is pick the dog food up where the skunk can't reach it, uh, or better yet, pull it in at night where the skunks don't have access to it. But pet food that's outside, fruit that drops off your trees, those could be removed and keep skunks out of your yard. One thing that you got to consider for skunks is how do I remediate the odor? And there's a lot of home recipes. Most of them don't work. Uh, I've, I've heard I don't know how many times in my life about tomato juice, and if it works, I haven't used enough of it to make it work. Um, but I've used enough of it to have several shirts ruined by the tomato stains when the dog shakes himself. There's a product called Neutroleum Alpha. And neutroleum alpha completely neutralizes skunk odors. There are commercial products that are also just as good. If you don't have that, a real mild acid like lemon juice will help cut that. So lemon juice poured into water and then help cut the smell right there. So it, it's the acidic part. You don't want to water it down so much that it's not cutting the, the skunk odor, but but uh, lemon juice is probably a lot better than tomato juice. Squirrels are not fur bears. Skunks and raccoons are both protected fur bears in Texas, but squirrels are not. They're considered game animals. Some counties have got a year-long season, while other counties have no season or, or a, a, a fall only or a fall and spring season. You need to look at where you are. Exclusion is the only successful long-term solution for squirrels, and, and everybody with a pecan tree in their yard has got squirrels in their yard. Uh, what's worse is if you've got wires that, that are, go from, through the pecan tree over to your house and you've got squirrels on your roof, and they can, they can work a little hole about the size of a quarter into a hole about the size of a dollar and gain, gain access into your roof pretty easily. They make all manner of squirrel exclusion devices from things that you could put around wires, little cones that will keep the squirrels from walking on the wire, to uh, tin that you can wrap around trees and the bottom of bird feeders. Squirrels can be live trapped fairly easily. Again, something like peanut butter, something that smells and gains their attraction uh, would be an important bait to put in a live trap. Shooting if they're in season and you're not in a town that, that prohibits shooting in city limits is effective at getting rid of a squirrel problem, but you're going to have another squirrel problem before the year's over. So, so those would be last resorts. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a personal story about solving squirrel problems. I was trapping uh, variegated ground squirrels in an urban area, and, and variegated ground squirrels, their only crime was eating, you know, apricots off a tree at the wrong time of year and, and making homeowners mad. And near our office, we had a ditch that ran behind there with a lot of 
of Russian olives on it. So I took the squirrels to the ditch and I turned them loose on the ditch and I was feeling pretty good about myself. And a couple of the ungrateful squirrels got underneath the hood of my truck and ate most of the wires off. So if you're planning on relocating squirrels, I would recommend you relocate them someplace other than where they're going to damage somebody else's resources. Um, they're, they're very good at uh, tearing things up. Armadillos. I don't even know the legal status of armadillos. They're certainly not fur bears. They are wildlife, and Parks and Wildlife has regulative authority over all wildlife. But almost all of their damage is through digging in the lawn. There's a whole lot of different armadillo species. The only one we have in Texas is the nine-banded armadillo. Nine-banded armadillos and, and all armadillos are very, very primitive. If you if you ever see an armadillo skull, you ought to study it. Their teeth are almost like dowel rods. They're a single root, a single tooth, no enamel, and they offset each other. So it's just like a little picket fence that, that meshes with a picket fence underneath. They eat soft bugs in the grass. They eat earthworms. And so the damage that you see from armadillos is is tearing up your lawn, waddling a little bit, tearing up another spot on the lawn as they look for grubs or earthworms down in there. And while you can move that particular armadillo and save a patch of lawn, you're still going to have grubs in your lawn. So there's commercial lawn treatments for grubs that, that get that uh, get at the, the food source. If you remove the food source, they're, they're going to move right on through. Uh, you can also modify your watering schedule. Some of us have had to do that because of the drought anyway. But but the, if the, the bugs move up and down in the soil based on moisture, and so if you can modify that and get them down a little bit lower, the, the armadillos cannot find them. You can shoot an armadillo if you're in a place where shooting is allowed. Um, they're, they're not very hard to shoot. You just have to go out at night and make sure that there's a safe backstrap. But again, they're they're there for a reason, and, and dealing with the reason is important. If you're going to live trap an armadillo, you need to know that there's probably no bait that's an effective armadillo bait. I know people that have put tomatoes out there and then let the bugs grow up in the tomatoes, and eventually they catch an armadillo. What we recommend is setting a cage trap uh, and making sure that the bottom wires are, are in the dirt, that you, you wiggle it back and forth and cover the bottom of the floor with dirt, and then building small or fairly large wings out. They, they don't have to be very tall, but they might have to be long. But put a wing out on each side of that trap so as the armadillo waddles across your lawn, he hits the wing, follows the wing to the trap. They're in a V-shape and then goes in the trap because that's the way to get where he's going. So you're not really baiting an armadillo as much as you're just funneling him towards a live trap. Opossums, we get a lot of calls on opossums from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, I don't know that they do a whole lot of damage. They scare a lot of people. Um, when they go into the garage and, and move something, move a box, and there behind the box is an opossum. Opossums are the North America's only marsupial. I don't know if you know that these are opossums, and the things that they have down in Australia and New Zealand are considered possums. I think everybody in North America drops the O shortly after learning about it, but there is a difference technically between a possum and an opossum. In North America, the opossum has more teeth than any other North American mammal, a land mammal anyway. And uh, when somebody gets uh, surprised by an opossum, usually they've got their mouth open and they're showing all 36 of their teeth or however many there are. And uh, it, it can be a bit of a fright. Uh, opossums, of course, are famous for playing dead, and they play dead as a response to a a body grabbing event. So, if you've got something like a snake catcher and you can grab that opossum behind the neck, he's just going to fall over, and then you can just move him out of your garage. Exclusion from your house and garage again, the overhanging branches on your on your lawn, uh, roof uh, may be important. But opossums 
really get active when it's cold outside. They do not tolerate the cold very well. Uh, you'll see bobtailed opossums often following a cold winter. And what really happened is parts of their tails, parts of their ears will freeze and and uh, fall off. And, and they look for inside places and warmth when it gets cold. So removing uh, access to your garage, especially on a cold night, removing food sources like pet food outside will probably preclude almost all of the opossum incidents that you might come across. When we're setting this up, we, we were talking about the species that can cause damage, and javelina are one of those that we're actually getting more and more uh, complaints about. The uh, first javelina are expanding their range. They're getting a little farther north, and they've become well-established uh, west of the Metroplex up in that area. Um, and so there, there's more people who are unfamiliar with javelina. Javelina are a game animal. You need a permit from Parks and Wildlife to do anything with them, and you're probably not going to get one. I mean, if they if they really become a real problem, I suppose uh, there can be some solutions. But uh, removal of the food source, the reason that they're there is a, is a real practical way to prevent or, or solve a javelina problem. Hazing javelina actually works pretty good if people do it, noisemakers do it. Um, if, if you want to throw rocks at them, you can throw rocks at them to haze them away. Don't try to haze them with a dog. That actually doesn't work very well, and, and they'll come back maybe as a pack against the dog. They, they will defend against canine intruders like they would against a coyote. So hazing by people can be an effective way. Almost every javelina problem I've ever encountered was because somebody somewhere was feeding javelina. They like them. They may be actually raising bottle-fed javelina, which is against the law. But they may, um, they may, if you could find out where they're being fed and break that habit and, and uh, keep them from becoming habituated to people, you can solve almost all the javelina problems. Hazing sometimes has to be repeated several times, and if there's a sporting season, if it's in an area where you can hunt them, if you shoot one javelina out of that herd, that reinforces the hazing a whole lot better than sitting there and honking horns and flashing lights and all the rest. So if that's a legal option within the hunting framework, shooting a javelina it will reinforce hazing. I've got deer up here, uh, white-tailed deer in Texas. Again, they're a game animal. A permit is required. Parks and Wildlife have got a number of programs associated with community-wide deer overabundance. Urban deer are, are uh, very successful at avoiding predators, maybe not so successful at avoiding cars. And exclusion on a large-scale basis is not very practical. You might be able to exclude them from an apple tree while the apples are ripening, but excluding them from your yard, excluding them from a neighborhood, probably not much of an option, and it would be very expensive. Most of the problems we see on a nuisance deer, not just an overabundance of deer, but a nuisance deer problem, is about deer browsing on ornamentals. And there are some ornamentals that are not preferred by deer. Uh, you know, things like pines are much better around deer than broad-leafed plants. So you can talk to your ag agent and AgriLife Extension and, and uh, learn which ornamentals may be best for your area that would not attract deer. Um, you might be able to exclude them from a garden plot, uh, especially if there's a lot of other food around. Uh, you do need a community effort if you're going to try and do it on any kind of a landscape basis. And again, there are a lot of people who will tolerate a lot of deer before it becomes a nuisance to them. So you may not get consensus within the community. I've got reproductive inhibitors up here. There is a single licensed reproductive inhibitor for deer. It's called Gonicon. Our agency actually has it registered with the EPA. It is not registered for use in Texas. Gonicon in experimental applications has been used to keep an individual deer from breeding. But to be perfectly honest, the research has not been done to see if Gonicon would prevent a deer herd from growing. In fact, if 
half of your does don't breed, you may see something like compensatory survival on the other half of the fawns, and the herd may still continue to grow. So reproductive inhibitors, while they're very attractive for a lot of people, are still very experimental. Uh, we don't see a lot of use for them in Texas, uh, at least right now, and um, their their use nationwide is very limited. There's only been a single uh, community that actually tried them on an operational basis, and the jury's still out on whether or not the deer herd has shrunk at all. So reproductive inhibitors, uh, you may hear about them, but they're they're really not much of an option. The last uh, species I'm going to talk about in detail, I guess, is, is bats, and, and I, I even said that wrong. There, bats are multiple species of bats. We've got a lot of bat species in Texas. The Brazilian free-tailed bat is, is one of the most common bats, and, and uh, they do migrate quite a bit. So you see bat problems, uh, nuisance bat problems, especially in the summer and the fall. In the summer, the bat problems are as they get into nursery colonies. Female bats go into a cave or, unfortunately, into a house or a building and have their offspring. And at night, the females fly away, and then in the day, they come back to that nursery colony and nest, uh, nurse their young. They, uh, a bat colony can just about double in a short period of time in the summer. And uh, we get real problems as people start seeing those bats flying back and forth around the nursery colony. Exclusion is an effective way to deal with a bat colony in a building, but you've got to be very careful that you do not exclude bats from a nursery colony. First, it'll kill the offspring that are inside, and then you've got a stinky mess in your wall. And secondly, the bats will go crazy on the outside trying to get back into that colony, and you'll have bats on the walls, bats on the ground, bats on the rocks, and bats flying in the daytime. So an exclusion device should be used only in the fall after the young are flying. And that exclusion device can be as simple as a, a, a strip of a, a long strip of burlap tacked outside the wall where the bats are coming out. In the evening, bats will come through the hole in the building, and the burlap hanging against the building, they'll work down between the burlap and the the, the wall until they can fr fly freely. In the daytime, they can't locate that hole, or in the morning, they can't locate that hole to come back to it. And so they'll have to go find another roost. But again, you only want to consider excluding bats either in the winter when they've already migrated uh, in the early spring before they come back, or after the young of the year have already uh, started flying with the adults so that they'll leave and then they don't come back. We do have concerns about rabies in bats. About 1% uh, of the bats may carry rabies, and there are several bat rabies strains in Texas. Um, bats that are found outside of buildings should be considered uh, suspect and, and do not handle them without gloves on. Better yet, don't handle them at all. Make sure nobody handles them. Uh, bats that are on the ground and are very vocal probably have rabies. Um, they, it's a neurological disease, and bats become start to vocalize quite a bit. Bat rabies shows up in unvaccinated pets, and so that's just one more reason besides the law to have your cats and dogs vaccinated is because bat rabies are out there. Other species that we see nuisance problems with include nutria or beaver as they start girdling trees and and um, you can exclude beaver and nutria pretty good. They don't jump fences. A little 16-inch uh, tall piece of chicken wire pounded between a couple of posts will keep beavers from getting access to, to out, out of the creek and up, up on the bank where they would cut down trees. Interestingly, our agency uh, tried to find ways to protect individual trees from beavers other than wrapping them with wire. And you can take a latex paint and put as much sand as you can keep in suspension in there and then paint it on the tree up to the height that a beaver or new tree would cut it. And they may come and try it in a couple of places, but the, the, the grit in that sand 
held against the tree by the paint will keep them from chewing on that tree. That's a pretty cool deal if you've got one tree on your lawn. If you've got a whole creek full of them, you can't afford to paint every tree. Uh, we know uh, some some golf courses have even gone in and tried to match the color of the tree so that they they nobody can tell that that's the base of that tree's been painted. But but it's a very labor intensive deal if you've got a whole lot of trees. But if you've just got one, that's a pretty safe way of protecting your tree. I mentioned earlier about education in snakes. Snakes are one of the species that can be relocated, probably should be relocated. Uh, snakes are there either because they're crawling from point A to point B or because there's a food source. And so if you've got a wood pile, you've got a big uh, pile of brush in the back and, and you see snakes around it on a regular basis, it may be because there's rats and mice in there and that's what the snakes are hunting. If you're going to handle snakes, you need to know what they are. Uh, we relocate snakes on a regular basis, but all of our people are trained on safe handling of snakes and, and which ones are poisonous and which ones are not. And relocating snakes is probably a, a pretty good ecosystem approach, but, but again, re remember that you need to know which, which snakes are which. Bird roosts are a problem, especially this time of year as grackles get in roosts. They're very noisy roosts. Bird roosts can be managed through habitat manipulation. Uh, birds' body temperature is relatively high compared to ours, 108 to 113 degrees, depends on the species. And so in the wintertime, they huddle together to just form a, a, a thermal cover. They use each other to stay warm on a cold night. And that's why you see large roosts in the winter that you don't see in the summertime. Uh, opening up the canopy can reduce the size of a bird roost. So cutting like every second or third branch out of a tree will actually not just give them fewer places to sit, but actually make it cool enough that that tree is no longer an attractive roost. Roosts can be removed by hazing, and we use pyrotechnics, uh, we call them whistlers and bangers, but they're little hand-fired um, things like bottle rockets to chase birds away from the roost. Interestingly, the more uh, robins that you have in a roost, the harder it is to move a roost. The fewer robins and the more red-winged blackbirds you've got in a roost, the easier it is to move a roost. And so you may have to work on a roost for four or five nights in a row to get it to relocate. Uh, smaller roosts, individual trees may be, the birds may be relocated with a laser. And we have uh, lasers that are designed, but red lasers are, are the best. And, and something as simple as a laser pointer can actually move individual birds. They don't like it. it. It only works in the dark. I mean, the dark, dark. And so if you've got a street light out there, see if you can turn it off while you're trying to move the, the roost. Uh, if it's a full moon night, wait for the dark side of the moon before you, you start to uh, start using a laser, but it will work to move birds off a roost. And the last one, the one that I really don't have a good solution for is bird rookeries. Uh, egrets, herons uh, get in rookeries to lay their eggs. They, they, they have pretty uh, simple nests, uh, lay a few eggs in there, and they are fully protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Uh, once a rookery is established, it's really hard to get rid of uh, both the current year and in future years. And, and anything short of cutting the trees down, that would probably would not prevent it from trying to reform the next year. Uh, we spend a lot of time with people trying to get them to uh, haze birds when they show up in the spring. And some of these the spring may be, may be a euphemism. They show up in February and early March. Yeah, still in the winter time, and and start colonizing around these uh, historical rookeries. That's the time to haze them before they build their stick nest, before they lay their first egg. Once they've laid that first egg, hazing them is actually illegal. And uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has not issued permits for um, for hazing of birds once eggs are found in the nest. So so we really don't have a good solution to that one, and I know that's a problem in some small community, well, some larger communities even, but uh, bird rookeries are a nuisance that we're still trying to find a decent solution for. If I'm not mistaken, that is the last slide. I'd be happy to take any questions uh, that might be out there. 
Thanks, Mike. Uh, we had a couple questions come in. One of them I'll address real quick. Uh, we had a question about why there was no discussion on feral hogs being the one of the more damaging nuisance species. And just to touch on that real quick, in this presentation, we decided to avoid the hog, uh, the subject of hogs, because we had done a previous feral hog webinar this year, and there's been a couple in the past. Um, I'm going to post real quick in the chat window a link that you can go access all of our archived webinars. And so you'll be able to look at those. Uh, and if you want to learn more about feral hogs, you can, can go back and look at those on those webinars. Another question that we had for you if, if is, I may, uh, sure. If, if I could, our agency deals with feral hogs on a daily basis. We take about 20,000 feral hogs, and I hate them. <laughs> I really do. Um, I, I intentionally stayed away from agricultural damage. Uh, you know, we also do work on coyotes that, that kill sheep. That's a, that's a whole different category of damage. Nuisance, the way we defined it here, kind of set the sideboards. And while hogs can become a problem, there's usually a lot more damage that are associated with it. So there was, there's a whole other reason we stayed out of it. But if, uh, if you want to talk pigs, I, I'll talk pigs sometime in, on another day. All right. Yeah, we'll. I would assume that we'll have some more webinars on those in the in the future since they are such a hot topic. Uh, one that we did have come in for you is raccoon roundworm tris transmissible to humans. Yes, raccoon roundworm is transmissible to humans. It, again, the eggs are passed in the feces, and usually what happens is is as that photo showed, there are a lot of raccoons outside. There's droppings in the grass, and then kids start crawling around in the grass. And so that's that's when it becomes a problem. Um, the, the, the larva can crawl through cuts in your hand. The, they can get on your fingers on the outside, and they get into the mucous membranes, uh, your, your nose, your mouth, your eyes. And so you, you've got to be real careful around raccoon roundworms. We tell people to, who clean up raccoon roundworm to treat it like it was gross. The, these, these, uh, these raccoon droppings are droppings. And if, so if you wear something as simple as a pair of rubber gloves, if if they're really dry, don't inhale the dust that comes along with it, but but uh, sweep them up and treat it like it was raccoon droppings. You probably are safe from that, but but avoid the situations where you have 30, 40 raccoons in one yard eating Oreos because that's when you see the, the roundworm larva in such numbers that it becomes a real problem for people. Okay. Had a few more that are that are coming in now, and I encourage everybody. We still have some time. If you have questions, continue to post them up in the chat window. The next one is: Can you assist with suggestions on "quote unquote" moles? So I assume that's moles or any other burrowing animals in the yard uh, on both control or elimination. Yeah, um, uh, moles are one thing, and gophers are another. And, and moles rarely push dirt up above the ground. Uh, I, I'm betting what we're what we're looking at is gopher mounds, and there are a number of different commercial products that are available to poison gophers. Uh, any gopher poison with less than 0.35 percent strychnine is considered a general use pesticide. If it's over 0.35% strychnine, it is a restricted use pesticide, and you have to have a pesticide license. But you could poison a gopher by, by opening that burrow up, work back from the mound about six, eight inches, and locate where the tunnel is, open that up and put about a teaspoon of toxic grain down that hole and leave it open. The grain has to be underground, but the gopher has to sense that there's air and fresh air coming in. He'll come up there to try and plug that burrow, encounter the grain, pick it up, put it in their pouches, and, and that alone will kill the gopher. It kills him underground, and he goes away. One thing about gophers that po most people don't understand is that they eat the roots of broadleaf weeds. And so the worst place to have gophers, for example, is an alfalfa field. <laughs> Those are big roots. They're very attractive to gopher, and it's a broadleaf. Dandelions in your yard will attract gophers. Gophers are kind of territorial. You don't have a whole lot of males and females in the same place. But, but the territories shrink and expand with food. 
So if you're talking about your lawn, then a broad uh, leaf herbicide would be one way to de decrease the, uh, the carrying capacity for gophers in your yard. One of the most intensive, labor-intensive ways of doing uh, gopher control is to, to dig out a hole and put a gopher trap in there. And, and if you've got that much time, you've got a lot of time on your hands. That's, that's a slow process, and we don't recommend that for anybody unless they're dealing with just one here or one there. We've done that ourselves, for example, at cemeteries because gophers around headstones really make people uncomfortable. But, but it's just because it's a single problem here or there. Okay, uh, and from that we'll move on to any suggestions about the control of coyotes. Yeah, coyotes are a whole another another animal, and and nuisance coyotes in town. Again, if we're focusing on nuisance, uh, nuisance coyotes in town are, are probably the hardest thing because they're very habituated to people, so they're used to getting around uh, folks and and all the rest. When they really become aggressive. They're easily called, and calling and shooting may be an option if you've got a safe backstop and, and it's legal to do. In the countryside, we, we remove coyotes primarily through trapping and snaring, and that's a whole other seminar on, on its own. But um, individual coyotes, coyotes are territorial, and so you usually only have a territorial pair and then a, some transients that work around the outside. Uh, any coyote two years old or older is probably a territorial coyote. Right now, the 2015 model coyote pups are getting kicked out of the territory in which they were born, and they're trying to drift around in the spaces between territories and stay out of trouble. They're fairly predictable in their movements, and they can be trapped, and, and if you've got net wire fences, they can be snared very easily. Uh, but you need to know what you're looking for. You need to know how to avoid a, a lot of non-target issues associated with it. You hang a snare underneath a fence in a lot of Texas, you're going to catch every coon, and you're going to catch half the hogs before you ever catch the coyote that you were after. So you need to know what you're looking for uh, before you start that. Okay, next question, do you require a license for access deer or is it just for white-tailed deer? Well, our agency, again, doesn't manage uh, um, uh, wildlife. It manages the wildlife damage. Axis deer are considered uh, an exotic ungulate under state statutes. And if someone is going to hunt axis deer recreationally, they must have a license. If axis deer are doing damage, they do not have to have a license, but, but they better be the landowner in that case. The landowner can take them without license if they're doing damage. The short answer is, is if you're going to shoot an axis deer, you need to have a hunting license. Okay. Um, one that we get asked often, uh, can we get a copy of this presentation? One, I'll say that it will be archived, uh, and I can post that link up again, but if if you would be interested in doing it, we can post a copy of a PDF of the presentation also. But I'll leave that up to you. That that's fine with me, and we, we I'll, you and I can get together and figure out how to get that done. Okay, we'll do. Um, it will probably be on the TWA website. If we do, I'll try and grab a link to the general area that it's going to be, and I'll post that up for for those of y'all that are interested. The next question we have is, are there any yard sprays or any sprays that, that could eliminate raccoon roundworm that you could broadcast out? No, not really. Again, uh, as I pointed out, the, the, the eggs are very resistant um, to, to environmental factors or, or to chemicals. Uh, if you can put it in a jar of formaldehyde and then hatch it three years later, uh, that, that's, a, that's about as resistant as anything I can think of. Um, what you can do, of course, is fill over it. Uh, the raccoon roundworm egg or the larva has to have um, has to have a host. And so if you break that life cycle by by covering it with just maybe even a half an inch of dirt and and then not allowing more raccoons on top of it, you're in pretty good shape. I would not be petrified of raccoon roundworm. 
I would also not let my kid crawl around in the grass. The, the, I, I mentioned a tragedy, and I didn't want to get into the weeds on this, but there was a case in California where someone was feeding raccoons, about 60 raccoons in, in one square block there in, in, a, in a town. And a small child, uh, less than two years of age, was crawling around in the grass. Where and, and it wasn't the house that was feeding the raccoons, but it was next door or maybe two houses removed, and came down with an extreme case of raccoon roundworm where the, the larva actually migrated to the child's brain. And the child it, it is incapable of further development beyond that age, and it's, it's, a, it's just a heart-rendering tragedy. But it could have been avoided so easily. Don't feed the raccoons. Don't concentrate them in that that case, and and don't let your kids crawl in the grass. Uh, I'm about five foot eleven and two hundred pounds, and if I encounter raccoon around where my body is probably resistant enough to just wall off that parasite in a blood vessel, or 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 pass it out and, and I don't have to worry about it impacting me, but it's small children that are that are really susceptible. Okay, I don't know if you can still hear me. I cannot hear Clint anymore, and so uh, oh, there you go. I'm here. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I was on mute. Uh, so this one, I think you've touched on it already, but uh, you may want to just blaze over it real quick uh, for time. It says I may have missed it as a sign in late, but is there a good way to control or eliminate armadillos digging holes in my yard and mulch beds? I've tried a box trap, but no success. Yeah, again, the box trap is is very hard for uh, for somebody to find an attractive bait. The armadillo slide is up on the screen right now. Uh, long treatments for the grubs that they are digging for is probably the most effective way to do that. So you can you can look in there and find some you know long long sprays that are commercially available. They're they're non uh, registered or non restricted products. Anybody can buy those. Uh, modifying your watering schedule, if you can do that and still keep your lawn good, keep it a little drier and the bugs go lower down into the soil and, uh, and they're not as easy to find. If you're going to trap an armadillo, you, you want to make a funnel with some short fencing. It could be chicken wire 12 to 16 inches tall and maybe 20 to 30 feet to the side and make that funnel go right to the trap. And again, work that trap down into the dirt so that there's dirt on the wires on the ground. The armadillo will actually cross your lawn, hit one or the other wing of that V that goes to the trap, and follow it along till it gets to the trap and then go in. So that's that's the, the handiest way to trap one. Okay. And we have three more questions, and we'll set it off. Uh, are there deer control programs in city settings? That is... Do they or would they allow bow hunters to harvest some of those deer? Uh, in this particular case, they have a lot of deer that get road killed because of housing and commercial developments in the Shirt Cibolo area. Yeah, that's a that's a hotbed for a whole lot of deer, and whether or not the city council allows bow hunting is a city council rule. It's not a parks and wildlife rule, so that would be the first place to look. Deer control is actually being done that way more frequently across the country. Parks and Wildlife has got a trap, transport, and, and, and translocate program, a TTP program where you trap, transport, and process. They've done just about everything they can to work with communities, but of course the communities have to get consensus themselves, and that's where the problem usually breaks down. One group wants to maintain all the deer they can, they can possibly have. Another group is tired of hitting them with their car. A third group sees it as an opportunity for hunting and, and, and getting the city fathers and mothers to, to agree on that is, is the, the hard part. There's no universal solution in place in Texas right now. Okay. Uh, what about nuisance raptors? Raptors usually become a nuisance when you're working around their nests, and in particular, Mississippi kites can be a real problem when when they've nest in urban areas or, or 
peri-urban areas, you know, suburbs, uh, golf courses, those kind of areas. The the hazing can work to a point. Um, of course, the problem is a nest, and so trap and relocate is not an option. You can haul a nesting Mississippi kite 50 miles, and he's probably going to get back to the nest before you do, and you run the risk of orphaning the, the chicks that are in there. The best solution is hazing before they lay eggs. The next solution is working with a licensed rehabilitator, and maybe they can raise the chicks and put them somewhere else. And as soon as the chicks are gone, that behavior is done. But uh, the, the the nuisance aspect of raptors is, is usually associated with nesting, and you can't always stay out of a nest area, um, especially when it's a, a high-traffic area like around a courthouse or a golf course. Okay, uh, one more question on raccoon roundworms. Can dogs get them? Dogs would not be a, a sufficient host, and so if a dog picks up a raccoon roundworm larva, it will actually pass through the dog and, and, and not be infective. So, um, no, it, it, dogs would not be an, uh, an adequate host for raccoon roundworm. That, that's not to say they're not going to encounter it. They're just not going to come down with it. Okay, and last question we'll get to. Aside from lawn damage, is there anything associated with armadillos that would create a problem if they were on school grounds, say kids 18 months to 14 years of age? No, I really don't believe there is. Armadillos uh, lack the, the incisors in the front of their mouth. They couldn't bite a kid's finger unless he stuck it all the way towards the back of their mouth. They they could scratch a, a, a child, um, but there's there's no real infective tissue other than, you know, they got dirt in their toenails. Um, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to keep armadillos on the school ground, but I don't know how you could exclude them. They are not a human safety risk when they're on a school ground. There's a, a lot of discussion about armadillos getting leprosy. That's not the kind of thing you pick up from the grass. That's when you would come in contact with an armadillo, and, and it's, it's a bacteria like, like what causes leprosy. Armadillo handlers don't get that. So I, I see no risk, uh, no human safety risk from armadillos. Um, just a lot of lawn damage. Okay. Good deal. Well, I uh, I posted up a link for those of y'all that are interested to – first, I posted a link for the webinars where you can find the archived version of this webinar uh, to go back and look, listen to the presentation, listen to the questions and the answers again. I also posted a link that will take you to where we'll post the PDF version or however we present it. Uh, the, the print version of this presentation, so you can go back and access that again. I would encourage everybody, if you're interested, to tune in on January 15th for our next webinar. It's going to cover what bucks do during the rut, and that's going to be presented by Dr. Dave Hewitt with Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute. Um, with that, I think that wraps us up. We're right on time, so we'll go ahead and shut it down. Mike, I really appreciate the presentation. Extremely informative, and it'll be a great resource to have, have our